Thank you very much and welcome back to our second presentation in our series, Religion, What Went Wrong? I really enjoyed our first night together yesterday, had some wonderful conversations with several of you afterwards and look forward to continue our epic journey together tonight. And um, yes, the title might sound a little political, but uh, we're going to spend time in God's word and we're going to see what prophecy has to say about the development within Christianity. And uh, as, we, as I mentioned in our first presentation yesterday, and I want to mention it here again, what we are seeking to do in these four presentations is to make a clear distinction, a comparison and contrast between religion and Jesus. Because as I have traveled to many different places and had a lot of conversations with different people, I've met many people that are disappointed in religion. But what I try to seek to encourage people is to not become disappointed in the person Jesus. Because I believe that even though religion has had its ups and downs throughout the corridors of time, throughout history, throughout the last 2,000 years, Jesus is an amazing figure that we have a description of in the Bible and that is worth following. That's, that's what I believe. I didn't grow up as a Christian, but um, in my early 20s, I made a decision. I want to become a follower of this person, Jesus, because I was amazed by the character and the life that I read about in the Gospels. Uh, but of course, when you do uh, see the landscape of Christianity today, and you look at the landscape of Christianity over the last 2,000 years, there's no doubt that it's been a bumpy ride. It's been a bumpy road. Uh, I think I, I shared this quote with you yesterday from Sam Pascal that said, Christianity started in Palestine as a fellowship. It moved to Greece and it became a philosophy. It moved to Italy and it became an institution. It moved further into Europe and it became a tradition. And it moved to the United States and it became a business. And uh, that is really what has taken place in many ways when you look at Christianity today. For many people, it's a philosophy, it's a tradition, it's a culture, and even some places in the world, it's become a business. But what we want to do is we want to peel back these man-made layers and get back to the authentic Jesus in Scripture. We want to look at uh, what is the beginning of this movement and how can we get back to that beautiful experience of following the person Jesus. Now, we're going to look tomorrow at rediscovering what Jesus really said and promised. That's going to be our topic tomorrow. Now, tonight, we're going to again put on the prophetic glasses. Remember I said to you yesterday night that I wanted you to put on these glasses, figuratively speaking, and look at the world around you, look at prophecy, look at history through Bible prophecy. And so I'm going to invite you to turn those, to put on those glasses again tonight. And uh, I hope that you will like what you see. Mahatma Gandhi, he put it this way. He said, I like your Christ. I do not like your Christians. Your Christians are so unlike your Christ. And I believe that's what has caused many people to turn away or to become disappointed with religion. Because Christians, those that bear the name of Jesus, are sadly not always representing the person Jesus. And there has been a lot of power play within Christianity. And uh, Jesus himself uh, said these famous, spoke these famous words. And you find them in the fourth gospel, the gospel of John, chapter 18 and verse 36. He said, my kingdom is not of this world. However, what we're going to see tonight as we take a journey in Bible prophecy is that for the Christian church, it has often been the case that the Christian church has tried to make this earth their kingdom, uh, a kingdom of, of power, a kingdom of oppression. And we're going to take a look at that as we journey together. John Acton came with this, you know, spoke these famous words, power tends to corrupt and absolute power corrupts absolutely. And this is also the, tru the truth when we see, when we look back uh, at church history over the last 2,000 years. We see uh, chapters of church history where, where this is real, this is very real, that there has been a grab for power and this power has led to corruption. 
So we're going to put on the prophetic glasses, but before we do that and before we get into our topic, like yesterday, I always like to have a short word of prayer, asking the spirit that inspired the Bible to also be the same spirit that instructs and guides us in our understanding of scripture. So let us pray together. Heavenly Father, thank you so much that we can be gathered here once again. I pray that as we open your word, that you will open our hearts, that the same Holy Spirit that inspired the writers of Scripture may be the same Spirit that instructs us tonight. Guide us, help us to come closer to you, Jesus, and help us to have an experience with your word tonight is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Well, we're going to go to the book of Daniel tonight. Yesterday, we spent our time in the book of Revelation, which is the last book in the Bible. And uh, we talked about how the book of Revelation is an unveiling. It's a revealing, as the title suggests, of the person Jesus. But it also reveals what went wrong with religion, what went wrong with the Christian church. And we looked at some fascinating material yesterday. Um, I really enjoyed it. We went through Revelation chapters 2 and 3 as we looked at these seven letters that were written to seven different locations in Asia Minor or modern Turkey as we know today. And these seven letters were revealing some of the development that would take place within the Christian church from the days of John that wrote the book of Revelation 2,000 years ago right down to the times in which we are living. If you missed that presentation, I'm sure um, our organizers here will you know, tell you how to get a hold of that or it will get up on YouTube somehow someday uh, and you can have a look at that. But tonight we're going to go to a twin book of the book of Revelation, which is the book of Daniel, which you find in the Old Testament. Now, if you spend any time in Bible prophecy, you will find out that the book of Daniel in the Old Testament and the book of Revelation in the New Testament are like twin books. And the one explains the other. It's very important for us to read them together, to study them together, because this enables us to better grasp the material that is presented in the apocalyptic portions of Scripture, in these prophetic portions of Scripture. Now, why are we going to the book of Daniel? Because the book of Daniel reveals some of the power play that has taken place in history in the Christian church. And we're going to go to a prophecy. Uh, we will also spend some time in the book of Revelation, but we're going to start in the book of Daniel. And we're going to go to Daniel chapter 7. And so we'll have the scriptures on the screen, but you can also follow along if you have an electronic Bible with you or a paper Bible. But you'll, you'll have the scriptures on the screen here as well. And in Daniel chapter 7, the prophet Daniel records a vision that he had, a dream that he had, a prophetic dream. And in this prophetic dream, what takes place is Daniel receives this revelation about what was to come. Now, we talked about John yesterday. He was on the island of Patmos. He was banished on that island. He lived there 2,000 years ago. Now, the book of Daniel was written prior to the book of Revelation. As a matter of fact, uh, many Bible scholars believe that the book of Daniel was written about between 500 and 600 years before Christ. And uh, it was written in the context of the Hebrews, the Israelites, being in captivity in Babylon. And so Daniel was one of those that was in captivity in Babylon when he received these prophetic revelations that he wrote down and that we now know as the book of Daniel in the Old Testament scriptures. And in chapter 7, he receives this, this, this dream, this vision, and he sees uh, some great beasts, four great beasts coming up out of the sea one after the other. And the wonderful thing about the book of Daniel and particularly here in chapter 7 is we don't have to guess what this means because there is an angel that appears to the prophet Daniel and gives him the instruction and the interpretation of this dream, of this prophetic vision. And he is told, right there, you can read it in Daniel chapter 7, both in verse 17 and verse 23, that the great beasts that he saw are four kings or four kingdoms. Now, the title of our message tonight is a power play of kings, popes, and presidents. <laughs> and um, here we are introduced to four kingdoms in the book of Daniel. Now, let's read a verse here from, from verse 4 in chapter 7. It says, the first was like a lion, 
and had eagle's wings. I watched till its wings were plucked off and it was lifted up from the earth and made to stand on two feet like a man and a man's heart was given to it. That's the description of the first beast that Daniel sees in his night vision. Um, now, we don't have to, you know, pass around a hat and everyone throws in their, everyone scribbles down their answer and, or, or what they believe it, 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 this is uh, representing and you throw it in the hat and then we toss the hat and then we just pick out an answer. That's not how we're going to do it because the Bible itself gives us the answer as to which power we are talking about here. We don't have to guess because in the Old Testament, very interestingly, Another prophet by the name of Jeremiah describes the kingdom of Babylon, which came up against the kingdom of Israel. And in the description of Jeremiah, listen very carefully, it's very similar to the description that we have in Daniel chapter 7 of the lion with the wings. Uh, Jeremiah talks about the attack of the Babylonian empire and talks about Babylon this way. The lion has come up from his thicket and the destroyer of nations is on his way, and his chariots are like a whirlwind. His horses are swifter than eagles. Sounds very similar, and here Jeremiah is talking about the attack of the Babylonian kingdom against Israel. And so we recognize this first beast as representing the kingdom of Babylon. And Babylon ruled between 605 and 539 BC. Now, for those of you that are a little bit familiar with Bible prophecy, you will know that in Daniel chapter 2, there is another prophecy which also resembles some of these kingdoms that we find in Daniel 7. Uh, Nebuchadnezzar, which was king of Babylon, had a dream. And in this dream, he sees this image that is made up of all these different metals. And then the prophet Daniel interprets the dream to him and says, you know what? That hat of gold that you saw in the dream is a representation of your kingdom, the kingdom of Babylon. And here in Daniel chapter 7, we have a repetition of this prophetic line of these different kingdoms that would come. Now, why we are dealing with this prophecy is because it's going to lead us up to the arrival of a power that brings us to a point in history where religion really went wrong. (laughs) So just hang in there as we go a little bit through these different kingdoms because our destination of this prophecy is going to really help us understand what went wrong with religion and this power play between kings and popes and even presidents. Um, And so we have Babylon as the first power um, revealed here in Daniel chapter 7, but that wasn't the last beast or the last kingdom that Daniel saw. As a matter of fact, in verse 5, we read, and suddenly another beast, a second like a bear, it was raised up on one side and it had three ribs in its mouth between its teeth. And they said thus to it, arise and devour much flesh. So Daniel has seen the lion with the wings and afterwards he sees a bear that's raised up on one side and three ribs in its mouth. And this is the next kingdom that came after Babylon. It's the kingdom that conquered Babylon. And if you look back in history, it's not hard to find out which kingdom this is. It's none other than the Medo-Persia Empire. The Medes and the Persians um, together conquered the nation of Babylon. And uh, they ruled between 539 and 331 B.C., And represented here by this bear that was raised up on one side and had three ribs in its mouth. Now we move on. There's a lot more time that we could spend on each of these beasts. But we want to get into our material here of what went wrong within the Christian movement. And this this prophecy is going to get us there as we move through these various kingdoms. So take notice of verse 6 in chapter 7. Verse 6. After this I looked, and there was another like a leopard, which had on its back four wings of a bird. The beast also had four heads, and dominion was given to it. So we go from the lion-like beast to the bear-like beast to the leopard-like beast. And this leopard, quite a picture, four wings, four heads. You know, if if a lion represents, you know, kingly power, then a a bear represents really the strength, and the leopard is really representing speed, especially if you put four wigs on its back. And this kingdom that is represented here as the third kingdom was also a rapid conquering power, and it was none other than the kingdom of Greece. And it was under Alexander the Great that the Greece Empire conquered the then known world in a rapid 
um, in, in a rapid succession, in a matter of about eight years, they <laughs> conquered vast, vast territory, um, uh, and, and, and many countries and nations were, were subject to Greece. Greece reigned from 331 to 168 BC. And if you go back to the prophecy in Daniel chapter 2, we are just following the statue and we're, getting, we're, getting, we're just going from one kingdom to the next kingdom. The head of gold representing Babylon, the chest and arms of silver representing Medo-Persia, the thighs and belly and thighs of brass representing Greece. And here in Daniel 7, the lion representing Babylon, the bear representing Medo-Persia, and the leopard representing Greece. Very interesting how prophecy brings us through these various empires. Now, verse 7, take notice of the fourth kingdom, because now it starts really getting a little bit more, a um, little bit more detail is given when we get to this fourth kingdom. Verse 7, after this, and I saw in the night visions, and behold, a fourth beast, dreadful and terrible, exceedingly strong. It had huge iron teeth. It was devouring, breaking in pieces, and trampling the residue with its feet. It was different from all the beasts that were before it, and it had ten horns. Now, which kingdom came after Greece? Again, we can just go back into history, and it's not hard to know. This was none other than the Roman Empire. And the Roman Empire, pagan, the pagan Roman Empire, is represented in this prophecy as this dragon-like beast that has ten horns on its head. Now, Rome ruled from 168 BC, and it's a little hard to put an end date to the Roman Empire because it was really not conquered overnight. It was rather, it, um, it fragmented because there was corruption from within, and then there were various tribes that were attacking its borders. And so it was really a gradual fall, but, you know, there are quite some historians that, put that, that, that will place it around the year 476 AD. Now, take notice what the prophecy tells us after it, this description of the fourth beast has been given. And we are now here, um, and, and, and just this is kind of an interesting uh, picture before we get into the description uh, further of the fourth beast. Uh, if you go to Nuremberg Town Hall in Germany, you will actually find uh, sculptures of these four beasts. This is the town hall there, and you will find uh, at the entrance there are two entrances, and at the entrance you will find actually the sculptures of these beasts and also the sculpture of, um, of, of these, these men that are arrayed in this typical adornment of these various countries or nations that we just mentioned. Very interesting. Now, verse 24. Look at this. The ten horns are ten kings which shall arise from this kingdom. So the fourth kingdom is Rome, and out of Rome would come ten kingdoms. Now, when you look at the division of the West Roman Empire, it's very interesting to note that it was divided among these various tribes. And when you get to verse 8, the prophecy tells us that among this division, something was going to happen. Now, look at verse 8. I was considering the horns... And there was another horn, a little one, coming up among them, before whom three of the first horns were plucked up, plucked out by the roots. And there in this horn were eyes like the eyes of a man, and a mouth speaking pompous words. Babylon, Medo Persia, Greece, Rome, division of Rome. And then out of the division of Rome, there's a little horn, a little power that is coming up. But this power is different from all the other powers. Because here we're not just talking about a political, geopolitical power, but we're also talking here about a religious power as we're going to discover when we look at the identification marks of this little horn. Take notice. The little horn arose among the ten horns. In other words, it came out of the Roman Empire. It arose after the ten horns. So it arose, it came after the Roman Empire's breakup. It was different from the ten horns, and we're going to discover it's not just a political power, but it's also a religious power. And when you look at these characteristics and you put them together, there is um, a power that is emerging here. Uh, as a matter of fact, one of the most clear 
signs is that it would displace three of the other horns. And there was a power that rose around this time, in this place, that defeated three other nations, the Heruli, the Vandals, and the Ostrogoths, in order to make place for it to rule. And here we are talking about the transition, the historic transition from what we can call pagan Rome to what we can call papal Rome. Now take notice what history tells us. Um, to the succession of the Caesars that ruled over pagan Rome came the succession of the pontiffs in Rome. When Constantine, and we talked a little bit about Constantine yesterday, didn't we? When Constantine left Rome, he gave his seat to the pontiff. Now, there was a vacant power because what happened was Constantine was the first Christian emperor. And uh, he transferred his capital from Rome to Constantinople, which we now call Istanbul today. And he left in Rome, he gave power in Rome to the bishops. Now, the quote that we started our presentation with tonight said, you know, something about power tending to corruption, right? Power tends to corrupt, and absolute power corrupts absolutely. Well, that is what we are seeing take place here because a church was never supposed to have that kind of political power, right? Jesus never intended his disciples when he sent them out to have political dominance over nations. As a matter of fact, what he wanted them to spread was the kingdom of God. What he wanted them to spread was the love of God. What he wanted everyone to know is an understanding of the gospel that Jesus had come into this world and given his life for them. He had taken their sins upon himself. He had paid the price on Calvary. He had risen from the grave. The tomb was empty. Death had been defeated. This was the message that was to go into all the world. And it was empowered by the Holy Spirit. But sadly, in the journey of Christianity, the church became more and more politically aligned with the powers in Europe. And the bishops started even ruling, and popes even started ruling over kings. And the kings were under these religious authority, and, and, and this was never meant to be. And of course, what comes out of this was a lot of corruption, a lot of persecution, as we also looked at yesterday when we went through these seven letters in the book of Revelation. Stanley's History, page 40, says, The popes filled the place of the vacant emperors of Rome, inheriting their power, prestige, and titles from paganism. The papacy is but the ghost of the diseased Roman Empire sitting crowned upon its grave. And this is kind of a very tragic and sad chapter in Christian history. Because what came out of this was a great persecution against those that thought differently than the church. Uh, we talked already about Constantine yesterday, Constantine the Great. It was during his reign that a lot of pagan practices started coming into the church. It didn't happen overnight, but it happened gradually. Um, Constantine, uh, this famous painting, the donation of Constantine, Constantine gives his power to the authority, to the church, to the uh, church of Rome and the rulers there. And uh, out of that, we um, experience this period that we referred to yesterday as the deformation. Remember, I said, you know, a little crash course in history without crashing, but <laughs> the crash course is history can basically be, div be divided up very simple here in kind of these, these, these three uh, epochs or three chapters. You have the formation of the church. Jesus calls his disciples. He empowers them. He sends them out. They go preaching and they start, you know, raising up these movements and these churches. And then... We get a little bit down into the journey, down into the centuries, and then we have this period that we can refer to as the deformation. Pagan practices starting coming into the church. Teachings are now propagated that Jesus never taught. And this is taking place throughout many centuries, the deformation. And that's why we need a reformation. And what's the reformation all about? The reformation, sola scriptura, the Bible only. It's like getting back to the source, getting back to the roots of what did Jesus actually teach and, and removing the man-made layers of tradition. And this was also a journey. It's like, it's like you're driving through a dark tunnel 
And you know how it is when you're driving through a dark tunnel and it's a long tunnel and then suddenly you come out and you get into the light. It can almost hurt your eyes for a moment. Or maybe you've had, you know, in the morning you're sleeping and your spouse suddenly turns on the light and ah, oh, you know what that's like, right? Everyone's done that. <laughs> and, and you're like, oh, it almost hurts because it's, it's just so much. The contrast is so much. So the Reformation, it wasn't that overnight everything was solved. As a matter of fact, it was a process of rediscovering what Jesus had said. Rediscovering what Jesus had actually taught. Rediscovering what it means to be a disciple. What it means to be a follower of the person Jesus. And I believe that we're still, in, in a sense, we can still say that we're part of that Reformation movement, right? We're still studying the scriptures to see what Jesus taught and how we can live to his glory. Well, what were some of the unbiblical teachings that entered into the church during this period that is often referred to as the Dark Ages, during this period of this deformation? Well, different things. Uh, for example, that salvation was only through the church. What did Jesus say? Come unto me and I will give you rest. You know, my yoke is easy. My burden is light. You know, Jesus said, come unto me. So we are to pray to him. He is the one that saves. The church is to be an instrument used by Jesus to reach people and bring them to Christ. But what happened in, in history is that the church made themselves the deliverer of salvation. Other things that took place was that confession uh, took place uh, to the priest instead of Christ. And so you have now a human being that is a sinner, and they are now standing between God and us, rather than we, us directly praying and asking for confession to the only one that can forgive us, and the only one that can truly empower us, which is none other than Jesus Christ. So confession to the priest instead of Christ. Uh, we have prayers no longer being uh, dedicated uh, solely to God or to Christ, but now, only, now also to diseased saints. Uh, false teachings on purgatory, the immortality of the soul, uh, Sunday worship. Now, we're not going to go into all of these in this series, but um, I'm sure that if you're interested to know more about this, there is... You know, there are Bible studies about these topics. Very interesting how throughout church history, there were these, these, these teachings that emerged that were really designed to give power to the church. Like, let's just use a couple of minutes here on purgatory, for example. Purgatory is the idea that when you die, your destiny is not completely fixed. And so you're not quite good enough to go to heaven, <laughs> Uh, but you're not really, it's not sure if you're going to burn forever in hell. And so there's this intermediate state of purification through suffering. But guess what? There's something very convenient. And that is that if you give money to the church, you know, the priest can say a prayer and you can go from purgatory to heaven. And by the way, and this is, this is, not, this is real history, there was a man, a man by the name of Tetzel and he traveled throughout Europe and they needed money. They needed a lot of money because they were building St. Peter's Basilica. You can visit in Rome today. And in order to get money to build St. Peter's Basilica, he would sell um, these little, you know, forms or this little, this little card or whatever uh, that says that, you know, you, you, you are now, you're now no longer in purgatory. Your loved one is no longer in purgatory. So you can give money to the church. You get, you get, that, you get that slip or whatever it was, and your loved one would be saved in heaven. Well, of course, this is nowhere to be found in the Bible. There is no scripture about purgatory in the Bible. Uh, Jesus is very clear when it comes to what it takes to be saved. It's believing in Jesus Christ. It's allowing Christ to fill our hearts. And he has given us the promise that he will come back and, and, and he will raise those to life that have put their trust in him. And there's no intermediate state. And so these were teachings that came in um, throughout these dark ages. Now you might say, well, but uh, uh, how can this be true that, 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 that there's so much of this deception coming from within? Well, it shouldn't surprise us too much. When we just go back 2,000 years and we look at the very story of Jesus himself, remember that the betrayal 
didn't come from without. It actually came from within. It was one of the disciples of Jesus that had been with him for three and a half years that betrayed Jesus with a kiss. And the word antichrist, which is the word that was often used, especially in the, uh, during the Reformation, uh, is a word that refers both to some power that is against Christ, but also seeking to take the place of Christ. And when you look at church history and, and, and you look at these developments that we're talking about here in this period of the deformation or the dark ages, we can actually see a power that is seeking to take the very place of Christ. As a matter of fact, take notice of this quote taken from uh, the papacy, from uh, the Catholic Church's own um, um, writings. It says, seek where you will through heaven and earth, and you will find but one created being who can forgive the sinner, and that extraordinary being is the priest, the Catholic priest. And here another one, the Pope is of so great dignity and so exalted that he is not a mere man, but as it were, God and the vicar of God. We hold upon this earth the place of God Almighty. Now, when you think about you think about those claims, and it's very clear that something has gone wrong. <laughs> We're talking about here religion. What went wrong? Something's gone wrong when man is t seeking to take the very place of Christ, to to take the very place that only God has. Now, it's nothing new that I'm presenting. This is not something that I, that I came up with. As a matter of fact, when you look at church history, it's very interesting. There were so many individuals that studied the book of Daniel, that studied the book of Revelation, and that came to very similar conclusions that the church of Rome... Uh, during the Dark Ages, specifically when we look at that period, um, was, was representing, was, was revealed by this prophecy in Daniel chapter 7, this little horn power. As a matter of fact, inv individuals like Luther and Calvin and Wycliffe and Tyndale and Cranmer and Bunyan and Isaac Newton and George Whitfield and Jonathan Edwards and even Charles Spurgeon identified this Roman power, this papal Roman power as this antichrist of Bible prophecy. Now, of course, when we talk about this, we have to be very careful because we're not, we're not trying to judge people here. What we're talking here about is an institution that has gone south, that has really um, brought confusion within the Christian movement. Now, of course, that doesn't mean that there cannot be individuals in this institution or church that are sincere believers. As a matter of fact, I myself come from a Roman Catholic home. My parents were raised Roman Catholics when they lived in the Netherlands, and so I, I know many Roman Catholics, and they can be lovely people. Of course they can. God is his people in all denominations, I believe, but what we're talking about here is a system, a system that has been teaching doctrines that are contrary to the teachings of Jesus, right? Now, in Daniel chapter 7, verse 13 and 14, and I love this part of the prophecy, because here we're looking at a contrast. Right after you have this manifestation of the little horn, look at what we read now right after this. This is powerful. This is beautiful. Daniel chapter 7, verse 13 and 14. Here we have a contrast of the kingdoms of this world and the true kingdom of God. And it says, I was watching in the night visions, and behold, one like the Son of Man. Coming with the clouds of heaven, he came to the ancient of days, and they brought him near before him. Then to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom. His dominion is an everlasting dominion, which shall not pass away, and his kingdom, the one which shall not be destroyed. So after this little horn comes on the scene, the next scene that Daniel sees is the Son of Man. Now, now this phrase very interesting, is used by Jesus in the Gospels. You can, you can, there are more than 80 places in the Gospels where Jesus refers to himself as the Son of Man. This was the, this was the favorite phrase of Jesus. He says, the Son of Man, and then he would give a parable. The Son of Man, and he would give a teaching. And he's referring to himself. Jesus calls himself the Son of Man. Where did he get that phrase from? From this prophecy in Daniel chapter 7. From this prophecy, now, when you look at the characteristics of the Son of Man and you compare them with the characteristics of these powers that we see in Daniel chapter 7, 
Ah, it's amazing. It's a huge difference. Take notice of this. The phrase Son of Man pointing uh, to Jesus appears 81 times in the Greek New Testament Gospels. And here are just a couple of these references. We're not going to go through all 81 of them, but just a few selected ones here. And I want you to get a little bit of a feel when we go through these passages, what the Son of Man is like. What is the kingdom of Jesus like in contrast to this little horn power? It says, the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. Now, did the kingdom of Babylon have a place to lay his head? Yeah, multiple places, multiple palaces. Of course, the king of Medo-Persia and Greece and Rome and the popes with all their riches and all their pomp and pride. But, but for Jesus, there's no place for him to lay his head. He came to this earth and he emptied himself of all his power and strength in order to live a life like you and me to save us eternally. Matthew chapter 9, verse 6, the Son of Man has power on earth. Now, if I would just stop there and don't read those last three words, what kind of power does he, does he have? Well, we've seen, we see the power that Babylon has. We see the power that Medo-Persia has. We see the power that the little horn has throughout centuries. What kind of power does Jesus manifest? He has power to forgive sins, to forgive sins. Now, that's the true power we need, amen? That's the real power we need. The son of man must suffer many things. Oh, here's a king that is willing to suffer for his people. Uh, be killed and after three days rise again. Till the son of man had risen from the death. Here there's a king that has power over death. There's no other king. However mighty he has been. No pope, however strong they have been. Or however powerful they have been. None of them have been able to conquer the grave. But Jesus has conquered the grave. Amen. Uh, Luke chapter 6, verse 5, the Son of Man is also Lord of the Sabbath. We're going to talk more about that tomorrow, what that means. But it means basically the Son of Man, Jesus, wants to spend time with us. Beautiful. He wants to spend Sabbath with us, which is holy time, with his people. Most kings and most popes, they are separated from those that they rule over. And you can't get close to them, but you can get close to the Son of Man. He wants to spend time with us. Luke chapter 7, verse 33. Take notice what kind of people the Son of Man hangs out with. The Son of Man has come eating and drinking, and you say, look, a gluten and a wine bibber, bibber, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. This is what the Son of Man does. Jesus spends time with those that are on the outcasts, those that are marginalized by society. He seeks to save them. Amen? Beautiful. Luke chapter, uh, John chapter 3, verse 14, and as Moses was lifted up, uh, the serpent in the wilderness, uh, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. That's referring to his death on the cross. John chapter 5, verse 26 and 27, for as the Father has life in himself, so he has granted the Son to have life in himself. He has given him authority to execute judgment also because he is the Son of Man. And this, my friends, is good news. Judgment, final judgment, has not been given to any pope. Final judgment regarding the salvation of souls has not been given to any king or president. Final salvation and judgment has been given to the one that was willing to give his life for you. Amen? He is the one that final judgment is in his hands. So, with what we have in mind from this incredible prophecy in Daniel chapter 7, now we're going to take this with us as we look at, for a few more moments here tonight, at a prophecy in Revelation chapter 13. This is going to get really interesting because here we're comparing these two prophetic books with each other. So we go from the book of Daniel written between 500 and 600 years before Christ in the context of his, the historic Babel, Babylon. And now we move forward to the time of the first century and we have John that was banished to the island of Patmos. And here he receives these visions and these prophecies and writes them down for us. And I want to take your attention to a prophecy found in Revelation chapter 13. And we read here about a beast that comes up from the sea. And immediately, as Bible students, we should be, hey, I've seen that before. Because that was all in Daniel 7, right? Beasts coming up out of the sea. And so we don't have to wonder what this means because we already know that a beast is a kingdom or a power that is arising. And so here we have another picture of this 
in Revelation chapter 13. Now take notice of the description of the beast in Revelation chapter 13 and see if you can identify anything from what we saw in Daniel chapter 7. Now this is taken from verse 1 and 2. Listen to this. And I saw a beast rising up out of the sea. Now the beast which I saw was like a leopard. Okay, that sounds familiar. His feet were like the feet of a bear. Oh, that sounds familiar. And his mouth like the mouth of a lion. Okay, we've seen that before. The dragon, sounds familiar as well, gave him his power, his throne, and great authority. Now, what's happening here? Remember I showed you this picture yesterday evening was the last slide. For those of you that were here yesterday, we looked at this incredible visual art of all the connections in the Bible, like a rainbow. You know, it's beautiful, this rainbow of connections. This is one of these connections in the Bible. Right? A connection where Daniel chapter 7, all these different beasts, and Revelation chapter 13 is really an amalgamation of the beasts of Daniel 7, now in one beast. And we should go as Bible students, ah, so there's something similar happening here. There is a repetition and enlargement. Something is being repeated, and now we're going to get more information about what has been revealed already. And so, when you look at what this beast does, it's very similar to what the little horn did in Daniel chapter 7. What did the little horn do? Daniel chapter 7, verse 21. I was watching and the same horn was making war against the saints and prevailing against them. So there was a persecution happening by the church. The church was a persecuting power. The little horn was persecuting. Now take notice of Revelation chapter 13 and verse 7. It says, I was also given, it was also given to him, talking about this beast here, to make war with the saints and to overcome them. You see the similarities in the language here? A persecuting power. Now take notice of the time frame of this persecution. There was given to him authority to act for 42 months. Now it's very interesting because in Bible prophecy, there is actually a, a, an interpretive key that allows us to understand the significance and the time period that is being spoken about here. And uh, in Bible prophecy, one prophetic day equals one literal year. And you'll find this principle actually in Ezekiel 4, 6 and Numbers 14, 34. Now, many people have asked me the question, why is that? Why doesn't the Bible just say speakly, very plain? Why does it actually even use beasts? Why doesn't it just say Babylon, Medo-Persia? You know, why does it use these, these symbols? And the reason is this. I can, I can give you two reasons. Reason number one, if Daniel and John had written straight out these things that would take place, I don't think we would have these books in our possession today. They would have been destroyed a long time ago because oftentimes they were talking about the very powers under which they were living and they talked about the fall of these powers. That would have been very unpopular literature in those days. So for the protection of prophecy, I believe it was often given in symbols and types. And I believe in another reason is for us to be engaged in searching the scriptures. Because how, when do you appreciate gold more? When you've dug for it or when it falls into your lap? <laughs> when you have to do some digging, right? And so, and so here we can engage our minds in the study of Bible prophecy. And it's not that hard when we compare scripture with scripture and we allow the Bible to interpret itself. And so what we're talking about here is a period, 42 prophetic months would be 1260 days, or if we use this interpretive key here of Bible prophecy, we would be talking about 1260 years. Now, this is the period when church and state were united in the old world in Europe. This is very interesting. In the year 538, Figilius ascended the papal chair, listen to this, under the military protection of Belzarius. Now, before that, the, the Pope could say whatever he wants, and people could decide whether or not they wanted to follow his dogmas or his teachings. But when the papacy now has the military behind them, church and state are now united, that's a whole different, that's a whole different game. Because now persecution breaks out, and for 1260 years, very interesting, there was this great the persecution taking place against those that believe differently and live differently than the church of Rome. And all types of things happen, and we don't have the time now to go into the details, but um, 
there's actually a very interesting book that describes some of this. It's called The Great Controversy, and I know there's some copies on the table. So when you walk out, you can maybe have a look if you, have, if you don't have that book already. It's actually a book about church history, and it takes us on a journey from the first century even to today, and it, and it covers some of this history. So if you're more interested in that, you can, you can take a look at that book. Um, but this, is, this, this period ended in 1798 when the following took place. The murder of a French man in Rome in 1798 gave the French an excuse for occupying the eternal city, Rome, and putting an end to the papal temporal power. In 1798, Hebrew Che, which was under Napoleon, France, made his entrance into Rome, abolished the papal government, and established a secular one. So what we're talking about here is the separation between church and state. Now, church and state were never meant to be united. I mean, the worst of history is when church and state were united. I mean, this was never the intention of Jesus, ever, that uh, some people would dominate in, on religious issues over others. As a matter of fact, when you look at the teachings of the gospel, Jesus is all about freedom of conscience. It's all about inviting people and not forcing people. And so when you talk about religion, what went wrong, one of the massive things that went wrong was the unity of church and state in, in the history of Europe. And it's a dark chapter uh, in the history of Europe. And so Pope Pius VI was taken captive by General Berchet. And uh, Revelation puts it this way in chapter 13, verse 10. He who leads into captivity, yeah, he will go into captivity. He who kills with the sword must be killed with the sword. Here is the patience and the faith of the saints describing really these events. Now, we can in many ways in 2023, we have the privilege of hindsight. So we can look back and they say hindsight is 2020, right? So when you actually can look back and something has already happened, then that's actually when you start seeing events for what they really are. Sometimes when you're in the middle of something, it's very difficult to make sense out of what's happening. But when it has passed and you can look back and you can evaluate, uh, that, that gives you an advantage. Now, of course, the advantage that we have should cause us to think twice about seeking um, political power as Christians, because this, is not, this didn't go well in, in, in history. But prophecy predicts, nonetheless, that there will be a new attempt for this to take place. And as we continue here in Revelation chapter 13, I want you to take notice what the prophecy tells us because now we're getting into a prophecy that is dealing with also not just history but is getting more and more current as it comes to what we are dealing with in our world today. Verse 11, it says this. Then I saw another beast coming up out of the earth and he had two horns like a lamb and he spoke like a dragon. Now, after John sees the first beast, a representation of the papacy, the Roman church, now he sees a second beast, but this beast does not come out of the sea, but he comes out of the earth, and he has two horns like a lamb, and speaks like a dragon. Now, if you look at the identification marks of this beast, it's very interesting. Uh, the lamb-like beast of Revelation chapter 13 comes up out of the earth, which is the opposite of sea. And in Bible prophecy, sea represents multitudes of people. You can find that actually there's a text that actually tells us this in Revelation chapter 17, verse 15. Waters are a representation of multitudes of people. So earth is the, is the opposite. So th this is a power arising in a, in a more unpopulated area. It's a lamb-like beast. Well, what is a lamb a representation of in the book of Revelation and all other places in the gospel? Lamb represents Jesus. Right? So a Christ or a Christ-like nation comes on the scene here. It has horns, and the first beast had horns with crowns on them because in the old world, the papacy was ruling over the kings of Europe. But this, this second beast has horns but no crowns. So a nation without a king. It's gaining significance when the first beast goes into captivity. So around 1798, it's gaining significance. It's gaining traction. It's coming onto the scene. Now, when you put those characteristics together, a nation that is significantly increasing in its dominance around 1798, has no king, is a Christ-like nation, a place where many of those that were being persecuted in the old world were fleeing to. We're talking here about the United States of America, I believe. Now, it's interesting to note that when you look at the United States of America, it was a place of freedom and new opportunities for the old world. 
Those that lived in the old world under the papal oppression, they wanted a country where there was no king and no pope. Get rid of kings, get rid of popes, because that was only problems. And so they come to this new land, and you can find this in the Declaration of Independence in the Amendment 1 of the United States Constitution. What does it say? It says, Congress shall make no law respecting the establishment of religion, because what? What went wrong with religion? Church and state were united. And so they thought, well, new country, new opportunities, let's not do the same mistake uh, as uh, we have experienced for centuries in Europe. Congress shall make no law respecting the establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof. Freedom of conscience. We also find it in the Declaration of Independence. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal. Well, that was not the case in old Europe. There was no equality. There was ranks, there were kings, there were popes, there were bishops that ruled over others. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal and that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Very well phrased, beautifully phrased. But um, would this keep forever? Would this, uh, new, would, would this new project, would, it, would, would, it, would, it just, would that be the end of the story? Well, prophecy predicts the following. Then I saw another beast coming up out of the earth. He had two horns like a lamb, but then it says, and he spoke like a dragon. And then it goes on to say, and he exercises all the authority of the first beast in his presence and causes the earth and those who dwell in it to worship the first beast whose deadly wound was healed. Now, here we're actually talking about prophecy that is still in the future. So, so what Revelation is revealing is that something that took place in the old world is going to re-emerge on the stage of world's history. And there's again going to be an effort to unite church and state. Church and state united. History will repeat itself. And um, sometimes it's sad because, or many times it's sad because if there's anything that we should learn from history, is not to repeat these things, but, but, but pro prophecy predicts that something like this is going to happen again. Now, it's a tragedy when church and state unites, as we've seen, because this was never the intention of Jesus when he proclaimed his gospel of peace. And the real question that I want to end with here tonight is the following. Who will you worship? That's the question of the book of Revelation. Who will you worship? And Jesus is the only one that is worthy of our worship. He died for us. He created us. He redeemed us. He has saved us. And he wants a relationship and a friendship with us. The word of God is our only guide. And I want to I end with, the, with this passage here from Matthew chapter 22. Because take notice how Jesus deals with this question of what to do with Caesar and what to do with God. And he says, uh, he comes into this very interesting situation. It says, uh, there are some of um, the uh, Pharisees that, that ask Jesus a question, and they actually ask this because they want to get him to say something in order to, to, to accuse him. And they say, tell us therefore, what do you think? Is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar or not? And they thought this is, a, this is really a thought through question because remember that Israel was under the power of Rome at that time. And so they thought if Jesus says, yeah, you know, pay taxes to Caesar, then they could discredit him before in front of the Jews. But if he said, no, 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 don't pay taxes, well, then they could discredit him in front of the Romans. So they thought, oh, we've found a question that we can use to, to get him this time. But Jesus, he masterfully moves his way into something very deep, what he says here, um, as he answers this question. He says the following, but Jesus perceived their wickedness. He sees right through it. And he said, why do you test me, you hypocrites? Show me the money. You can just see it in front of you. He, he takes the denarius, the coin of those days, and he holds it up, and, and the people are all watching in suspense. What is he going to say? And so they brought him a denarius, and he said to them, I can just imagine, I can just see the picture in front of me, that the people are, are all, you know, <gasps> holding their breath. Like, what is he going to say? And Jesus is holding up the coin, and here it comes. And he said to them, whose image and inscription is this? And they said to him, Caesar's. And, you know, just like many times today, on the coin, you have the, 
the head of the ruling power. And so you had the Caesar was on the coin. And then Jesus says, he said to them, render therefore to Caesar the things that are Caesar's and to God the things that are God's. Now, what is Jesus saying here? Caesar can have that coin. It has his face on it. Don't make a big deal about not paying taxes. That's not the real message of Jesus. He said, if, if Caesar wants that, you give that to Caesar. But there's something so much more important in life. There's something more important in life than paying taxes. Amen? <laughs> and what is more important? Give yourself to God. And you know what? The first thing that you read about in the Bible, about mankind, in the book of Genesis, chapter 1, it says that mankind, male and female, were made in the image of God. So God's image is on you. And so what Jesus is saying here is, you know, keep these things separated. You know, give to Caesar what belongs to Caesar. But more importantly, give to God the things that belong to God. And do you, do you know what belongs to God? You belong to God. Why do you belong to God? Because his image is on you. Just like the coin has the image of Caesar, it belongs to him. But you, you are created in God's image. And you belong to him. And so as we've gone on this journey tonight, and as we've looked at kings and popes and presidents, and as we've looked at the power play within the Christian church and where things went wrong, let's remind ourselves as we ended yesterday's presentation that even though Christianity has had its ups and downs, and even though Christianity, many things have gone wrong, in the big narrative of the plan of salvation, we're right on track. Amen? We're right on track. And Jesus has promised that he's going to come back one day and he's going to take those that have his image, and that's you and me, he's going to take us to a place that he has prepared for us. And you can be part of a different kind of kingdom, a kingdom that is not of this world, a kingdom that is not, not, not based on dominance and power over others, but a kingdom that is based on mercy and forgiveness and the love of your creator. Amen? And this is what it means to give ourselves to God. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for having been with us tonight in our second presentation of this series. Thank you so much, Lord. We've looked at a lot of material tonight, but I pray that the significance of that great gift of Calvary may, may, may just seep into our hearts and into our minds tonight. Help us to understand what it means that you gave yourself for us and that your image is on each one of us. We are created by you. We are redeemed by you. And I pray that we may be able to give ourselves to your kingdom. Help us to understand what your kingdom is like. It's so different from this world, Lord. Help us to live according to that kingdom in anticipation of spending eternity with you. Thank you again, Lord, for this journey. Thank you for all those that made their way here. May you protect and keep us as we travel back to our homes and bring us back together tomorrow again is my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you so much for coming. And tomorrow night, we're going to look at our topic. Let's go one slide back. Oh, it's gone. I know it anyway. And that is rediscovering what Jesus said and promised. That's going to be our topic tonight. I invite you back 7 o'clock here. Bring your friends with you. Bring your enemies with you. Let's fill up this place. Thank you very much.